Hosea 6 verse 7, Adam or Man, by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The word Adam is in Hebrew both an appellative noun, meaning man, and the proper name of the first man, much as if we in English should denominate the first man simply man. It is a natural consequence that in some of the passages where it occurs, the word is capable of either sense, and the commentators are puzzled in which way to interpret it. One of the most famous of these passages is Hosea 6 verse 7. In our so-called authorized English version, this verse is given thus, But they, like men, margin or like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. In the revised version, on the other hand, it reads, But they, like Adam, margin or men, have transgressed the covenant, there have they dealt treacherously against me. Still another rendering is suggested in the margin of the revised version, viz., But they are as men that have transgressed a covenant, there have they dealt treacherously against me. The main fact is that the two versions differ in their reading of the word Adam, the authorized version taking it as a common noun and the revised as a proper name. But the margin of the revised version suggests two ways of translating the verse, if the word be deemed a common noun. The difference of opinion thus represented by our English versions is not of modern origin. It goes back to the very earliest times, and indeed gave rise to divergent traditions of interpretation between the Eastern and the Western churches. The early versions of the Eastern churches, the Septuagint Greek and the Syriac, followed by the Arabic, took the word as a common noun. Jerome, on the contrary, in his Latin version, which has since his day occupied the position of the Vulgate version of the West, renders it as a proper name. Appeal to the underlying Hebrew was rare in the patristic age, and became ever rarer as the centuries sped away, so that we may be sure that, to the Christians of the East, this verse for ages spoke of a man's covenant, while to the Christians of the West it spoke of a covenant of God with Adam. Occasion for citing the verse did not often arise in the patristic and medieval times, and we can trace the matter very little in the extant literature. When the verse is quoted, however, it is commonly quoted by each section of the church after the fashion in which it read it in its Bible. The Syriac tradition is indicated for us, for example, in the comments on the Minor Prophets by Ishudah or Jesudad, a Nestorian bishop of Merv in the ninth century, whose work seems to have been much used by subsequent commentators. Like a man they have transgressed my covenant, he translates, and interprets, i.e., like one who transgresses the command of a fellow man, as if they were of equal degree. In this comment, Bar Hebraeus accords. It is all the more striking to observe that Cyril of Alexandria, though of the Eastern tradition, does revert to the Hebrew and derives from the Hebrew the other sense, like Adam transgressing the covenant, he translates, and he explains that the conduct of the Israelites resembled that of Adam, who, though he might have had communion with God and attained immortality and enjoyed the delights of paradise, yet neglected the divine command and fell from his pristine glory. Meanwhile the Jews, having the Hebrew text before them, interpreted it variously. The Targum introduces a plural form. They, like the primitive generations, have transgressed my covenant. After Grotius, this has usually been understood as a reference to the breach of God's commandment involved in the marriage of the sons of men with the daughters of God, Genesis 6 verse 4, by which the flood was precipitated. But Husson, in his annotations on Ababanel, considers the reference to be to Adam and Eve. Certainly the best Jewish comment gives the preference to the reference of Hosea to Adam. The meaning is, says Ababanel himself, that they have acted like Adam or the first man whom I put in the Garden of Eden, and he transgressed my covenant. The great name of Rashi may be quoted for the same view. Kimchi, on the other hand, reads the word as a common noun, as a man who conducts himself faithlessly towards his companion and transgresses his covenant. So God is belittled in their eyes, and they conduct themselves faithlessly towards him and transgress his covenant. It was not until after the revival of learning, when men's minds were brought back to the original texts of Scripture, that diversity of opinion on this passage began to show itself among Christian scholars. In the Reformation age, such translators as Paganinus, Vitablus, Junius, and Tremelius 
Monster and Piscata preferred to take the word as a common noun, and to this party Calvin lent the great authority of his approval. The difficulties of exposition on this supposition showed themselves from the beginning, however, in the different constructions proposed. Some, like Munster, Levelius, and Piscato, and Calvin himself translated simply like men, as men are wanted to do. Calvin explains that there is an implied contrast with God, and that the meaning is that they showed themselves to be men in violating the covenant. They have been men towards me, there has been in them nothing but levity and inconstancy. Already in this comment we perceive a tendency to read into the simple term men some sinister connotation such as will give point to the comparison of the Israelites in their covenant breaking with men. This is often given expression in a strengthened form, as for example by Drusius, who comments, like men, who are naturally light and vain, not to say covenant breakers. Drusius is even ready with a further supposition. The term men here, he suggests, may be used in a deprecatory sense as equivalent to common men in contrast with those in high place, so that the Israelites would be accused of acting like the vile among mankind instead of the noble. Other expounders, feeling the insufficiency of any of these interpretations, propose to translate rather as if it were a man's covenant, accusing the Israelites of dealing with God as if he were no more worthy of reverence than one of their fellow men. This is the explanation given by Vitablus, Tremelius, Junius, Paganinus, and others, but is rightly objected to by Drusius and Calvin, as involving too forced a construction. They do not add, however, what one would think worth adding, that it would seem to involve also a rather low view of how covenant engagements between mere men were wont to be looked upon. In the face of this diversity of exposition, one cannot be surprised to note that many of the best translators and expositors of the first age of Protestantism preferred to retain the familiar like Adam. They were included in this party Luther, Leo Juda, Aris Montanus, Castalio, Clarius, and Hugo Grotius. During the earlier period of Protestant scholarship, debate on the proper interpretation of our passage had no more than a philological interest. In the 17th century, a dogmatic interest in the passage was added by the rise into prominence of the covenant theology. In the translation, they, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant, the passage offers itself to the Federalists as a proof text for the covenant of works. The Federalists, as a class, must be acquitted, however, of any undue zeal to make much of this interpretation. No doubt a number of them do, as was natural, adopt it and defend it with conviction as well as with force and skill. Such thorough defences of it may be read, for example, in Branco's Ere de Lichehotsdienst, 8th edition, 1767, volume 1, page 297 to 299, or in John Mark's Compendium Theologiae Christiane, 24, 14. Compare also his Historia Paradisi, 2, 6 and 7, and his commentator, Bernard de Moore's great treatise, 3, pages 52 to 56. Others of them simply cite the passage in this sense without further remark. So, for example, Berman, Synopsis Theologiae, 1, 394, Braun, Systema Theologiae, page 250, and indeed sometimes do less than that, referring to it only in the most passing manner, for example, Witsius, Divine Economy, English translation, 1, 183. There are others who can scarcely be said to adopt this explanation, and certainly cannot be said to exploit it. Cocius himself deals with it very cavalierly. As Adam, possibly the term is employed as a proper name, equally possibly it is to be taken thus, as a man, that is, as any other man, they have not reverenced the holy name that has been named on them, as that of Christians, evangelicals, reformed, I do not understand it as a genitive, as a man's, for the covenant is not a man's but God's, who is invoked as a witness in covenant-making, unless possibly thus, as if it were a man whom they invoked as a witness, and they were able to shut his eyes as if they were holy. More clearly, Pictet says, the scriptures do not speak formally of the covenant of works, unless we wish to cite for this the passage Hosea 6 verse 7, and it is necessary to admit that the prophet can be otherwise explained. Van Maastricht is a little more exigent. The covenant of works is expressly mentioned in Hosea 6 verse 7, and these like Adam have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously with me there. Compare Job 30 verse 33. 
Here, K. Adam is taken by the best interpreters, the Vulgate, Tigurinus, Paganinus, Castalio, the Dutch translators, not as an appellative, but as a proper noun, though I confess there are not lacking others who prefer to take it appellatively. Perhaps the general tone of the Federalistic interpreters may be said to be fairly represented by the calm treatment accorded the passage by Tariton. That there is a covenant of works, he says, seems to be intimated not obscurely by Hosea 6 verse 7, where the Israelites are said to have transgressed the covenant like Adam, and they like Adam have violated the covenant. For although these words are capable of being expounded of the inconstancy of men, so that they should be said to have transgressed the covenant, as is wont to be done by men, who are naturally light and vain and often break faith, yet there is no reason why they may not rather be referred to Adam, so that they may be said to have violated the covenant after the example of Adam, our first father, who miserably broke the covenant made with him by God. A not dissimilar passage occurs at Job 31 verse 33, If I have hidden, it says, my iniquities like Adam, where there is a manifest reference to Adam's attempt to excuse and hide his sin, Genesis 3 verse 12. The general attitude of freedom towards this passage, characteristic of the Federalist divines, has come down to our own day and may be very well illustrated by the example of the Hodges, father and son. Dr. A. A. Hodge adduces it simply and without comment as a proof text for the covenant of works, indeed, but only after having shown apart from it that the transaction of God with Adam exhibits all the elements of a covenant. Dr. Charles Hodge does not appeal to it at all, and even intimates that there is no express declaration of Scripture to the effect that God entered into a covenant with Adam. It must certainly be allowed that the Federalists, though naturally predisposed to understand the passage in harmony with what they have gathered from Scripture as to the relation in which God placed himself with Adam, have not been as a class zealous to press it unduly. No further new point of view affecting the exposition of our passage has arisen until very recently. Meanwhile, all the old interpretations have found adherence. The translation, like Adam, has continued to command the suffrages of perhaps the majority of interpreters. The translation, like men, has been advocated by such scholars as Hosel, De Wetter, Ewald, Royce, Novak, 1880, and G. A. Smith. The Septuagint rendering, they are like men that break covenant, i.e., like specifically covenant-breaking men, has been defended by such as Henderson, Dillman, Schulz, Maurer and Simpson think the implication is that they are showing themselves in their breach of the covenant men of low stamp, the mere common people of the land, as distinguished from, say, the priests, which is Simpson's view. A new turn is given to the passage by such scholars as Schegg, Anton Scholz, and Guter, who think that by men here is meant specifically the heathen. Guter even translates, These, however, have transgressed my covenant as if they were heathen. The heathen, explains Schultz, had broken the Noahic covenant and the law of nature. Israel, in its dealings with Jehovah, were manifesting themselves as no better than they. Michaelis had arrived earlier at a somewhat similar view by conjecturally repointing the Hebrew so as to make it read like Edom instead of like Adam. It is the Abrahamic covenant that is in view, he explains, not an Adamic covenant of which the scriptures know nothing. Now among the children of Abraham, the Edomites were marked by this very thing, that they did not retain the covenant of Jehovah, and the Israelites were now imitating their covenant-breaking brethren. Michaelis goes so far in his confidence in his conjecture that he introduces the words like the Edomites into his translation, and in the notes expresses surprise that the emendation had attracted no adherence. Comparatively few moderns have been able to accept the interpretation so popular at an earlier period, which reads into the passage a genitive, like a man's covenant. We have happened to note, at any rate, only Tyner, 1828, as so taking it. A really novel line of interpretation was suggested late in the 17th century by an anonymous Dutch work called In Pundel van Hoogelete Hoofningen, which merits mention because of its revival in quite recent times. This turned on the proposal to take the word Adam as a proper name indeed, but as the name of a place rather than of a man. A city of this name is referred to in Joshua 3 verse 16, and the transaction recorded in Numbers 25 was somewhat arbitrarily assigned by the author of the work in question to this place. He therefore proposed to translate, They, that is, Israel and Judah, have transgressed my precept after the example of Adam, i.e., as they did in Adam. 
this sin at Adam, Numbers 25, being conceived as the beginning of the sins of Ephraim and Judah, at about the same time the great German orientalist, a Pfeiffer, sought the same general end by an emendation of the text proposing to read instead of Ke Adam, rather Ba Adama, that is to say, in the, i.e. this land, i.e. in Judah, as Adam, though placed in Eden, so Israel, though placed in Canaan, even there broke the covenant. These suggestions bore no fruit at the time. Of late years, however, the idea that a place must be meant here has been returned to, and a number of critics have sought in one way or another to provide for such reading of the text. Thus the Dutch critic Ort writes in verse 7, Ke Adam must probably be corrected to Be Adama, since the following there demands a precedent place name and Adma occurs also in chapter 11, verse 8. Valeton, Zeitschrift für Testamentliche Wissenschaft, number 13, 246, quotes this note of Ort approvingly, and Wellhausen improves on it by remarking, read, Be Adam, on account of the following there, and on account of the localization of the sins in the connected verses also, a place of worship is named, and a reference made to an occurrence there which is unknown to us. Novak reverts to the form of emendation suggested by Ort, but finds the passage even more corrupt than Wehrhausen does. The first half of verse 7, he remarks, cannot be in its right position, for there, in the second clause, leads us to look for a designation of place in it, which probably stood in the position occupied by Be Adam, which yields no proper sense. Similarly, Gouda says the reference of there, since the prophet is scarcely to be thought of as outside the land, is obscure, and the text is scarcely correctly transmitted. Kretschmer, while translating the text as it stands, they, supply the Israelites, are like Adam, they have broken covenant. There they have proved treacherous to me. Yet comments further, the text is undoubtedly corrupt. If we take Adam, either as Adam or as man or as heathen, the there hangs completely in the air. The corruption seems hopeless. The whole case is stated, finally, with admirable clearness, either by Professor Chain or by one of his successful imitators, the article is unsigned. The second mention of a place of this name, i.e. of the name of Adam mentioned in Joshua 2 verse 16, is in Hosea 6 verse 7, where for Ke Adam, revised version like Adam, revised version margin like men, os anthropos, we must at any rate read Be Adam, i.e. at Adam, to suit there in the next clause and to correspond to the localization of Israel's sin in verse 8. So in the main Wehrhausen, there the Israelites were traitors to Yahweh, and broke his covenant. Of course, there may be a doubt which of the places called Adam or Adamah is meant, and it may even be surmised that the letters A-D-M are incorrect. The fact, however, that the ford of Dami is on the direct route, so we must believe, to the place called Gilead in verse 8, suggests that the city Adam of Joshua 3 verse 16 is intended. The confluence of two important streams may well have been marked by a sanctuary. To the anti-penultimate sentence, a note is attached, suggesting that instead of Adam, Duma might be conjecturally read, the Eduma of the Onomastica Sacra, but, as it is immediately allowed, that this is obviously not the city intended in Joshua 3 verse 16, and also that it is also not very likely to be meant by Hosea, the suggestion may be passed over here as not advancing the matter. It may be quite frankly confessed that the suggestion that a place name should stand here is very attractive. It is quite true that the there of the second clause presents exegetical difficulties which would be avoided if a place had been mentioned in the former clause, and this consideration is certainly supported by the allusions to places in the immediately subsequent context. But it must be admitted that it is impossible to expound the text as it stands as referring to a place. Of course, if we judge the text of the Old Testament in general, and the text of Hosea in particular, to be as corrupt as the scholars we have just been quoting do, this fact would be of little moment. We should, in that case, be swift like them to adjust the corrupt text to any theory of interpretation we happen to have in mind. But we cannot for ourselves sit so loosely to the transmitted text on the one hand, nor on the other can we cherish such preponderant trust in our power of critical divination as distinguished from exegetical processes as so lightly to take refuge in conjectural emendations of the text in order to ease our task whenever we find ourselves faced by a difficult piece of exegesis. All experience, not only in the biblical but also in the extra-biblical texts, 
cries out against such a facile method of dealing with an author as issuing merely in a systematic corrupting of his text. In the present case, it is to be admitted that the emendation, as proposed by Verhausen at least, is a very easy one, involving only a change in a single letter, K into B, these two letters, moreover, being letters very easily confused, Kav and Bet. Indeed, one of de Rossi's manuscripts has actually made the change for us, reading Be'adam instead of Ke'adam. But this very circumstance, in indicating the ease with which the corruption assumed could have taken place, indicates also another fact, viz. the care with which the text has been transmitted in its present form. Throughout its whole transmission open to our inspection, the text has preserved the Ke'adam intact. Neither the manuscripts, nor the versions, nor the quotations made from it suggest the currency at any time accessible to our observation of any other reading. In these circumstances we decline to go behind the written text, save under a pressure indefinitely stronger than the exegetical difficulties which here face us. The passage is a difficult one, but we cannot consent to cut the knot, because we find it somewhat hard to untie it. And we must be permitted to suggest with reference to the textual question raised, that this seems to us a very suitable place to apply the sound textual canon Proclivi scriptione prestat ardua. A further remark seems here in place. The resort of the later critics to the emendation of the text may not unfairly be taken as an indication of bias. Speaking broadly, these critics are all agreed that an allusion to Adam's sin in Hosea would be too unexpected to be admitted and one may without impropriety suggest that it is an unwillingness to find such an illusion in Hosea, founded, as it is, on their inductions as to the history of religious thought in Israel that constitutes a large part of the difficulty of the passage to them. The very name of Adam, we are told, occurs very seldom in the Old Testament, and only in certain later strata of its formation. His sin is not emphasized, and the sinfulness of man is not traced back to it. Least of all is the transaction between God and Adam in the Old Testament called, or thought of, as a covenant. It is noteworthy, says Schultz, that Adam and his history are nowhere adverted to in the later literature, as Abraham's is, or Jacob's, or Noah's. Job 31 verse 33 does not mean, if I hide my sin like Adam, for this was assuredly not characteristic of Adam's action according to the narrative of Genesis. But if I conceal my sin after the manner of men, compare Psalm 17 verse 4, according to man. If the text is correct, Hosea 6 verse 7 should be translated, as is clear from chapter 4 verse 4, chapter 5 verse 10, they are like men who break covenant, i.e. entirely untrustworthy, false men. In Isaiah 43 verse 27, finally, Israel's first father, who has already sinned, is, according to the context, not Adam, since the subject is Israel in its contrast with other nations. It is rather Jacob Israel that is meant, the real ancestor and true type of the race. Only in the Apocrypha do we meet with literary references to Adam's fall, Wisdom 2.20 and following. Similarly, Clemen contends that there are no echoes in the Old Testament of the narrative in the second chapter of Genesis except in such writings as stand under Babylonian influence, for Hosea 6 verse 7 and Job 30 verse 33, he adds, belong here as little as Isaiah 43 verse 27. Although it was taken so by the federal theologians, yet the passage Hosea 6 verse 7 cannot be translated, like Adam, they have transgressed my covenant, for Berit is always elsewhere the covenant with Israel. Rather, Ke Adam must be taken absolutely and rendered after the fashion of men, or else Aderu Berit be adjoined to it so as to be translated as the Septuagint already does. These, however, are like a man that breaks covenant. If we could, with Verhausen, read Be'adam and understand a place of worship by it, then it would be entirely excluded any reference to Genesis 3. Similarly, in Job 31 verse 33, it is not, If I, like Adam, hid my sin, for this is certainly not according to the narrative in Genesis, especially significant of his action, but if I conceal any sin after the manner of men. To take but one other example, and this time from a dogmatician of the same school, Hoekstra writes, Nowhere in the Old Testament do we find even a distant allusion to the fall in paradise, unless we translate Ke Adam, in Job 31 verse 33, Hosea 6 verse 7, Psalm 83 verse 7, and Psalm 17 verse 4, with Ferdinand Hitzig. 1807-1875, to 1875, like Adam, by the rendering of Ludwig Hirzel, 
1801 to 1841 and others, as men do, seems to me more satisfactory. If this judgment of mine is right, then it is only by Sirach 25 verse 24 and Wisdom 2 verse 23 and following that the transactions in paradise and the fool are referred to, though both are so alluded to often in the New Testament. Two things appear to result from a survey of such passages. One is that these critics are pre-committed by their critical theories of the development of religious thought in Israel and the relation of the literary remains to this development, not to find an allusion to Adam, and especially not to Adam's sin, and more especially still not to a covenant with Adam in Hosea. The other is that on these grounds, not wishing to explain the passage of Adam's sin, they do not discover in the other explanations that have offered a satisfactory exposition of it. We cannot then accord to the rejection by them of the interpretation like Adam any great independent value. On the other hand, however, their desertion of the various interpretations which take the word as a common noun may fairly be read as an indication that those interpretations scarcely satisfy the mind of the candid inquirer. This judgment would in any event seem to be inevitable when these interpretations are examined on their own merits. The translation, they have transgressed, as if a man's covenant may be pronounced at once impossible because forcing a construction upon the Hebrew which it cannot fairly be made to bear. But, on the other hand, the translation, they have like men transgressed the covenant, remains vapid and meaningless, unless a sense beyond the suggestion of the words themselves is forced upon it. The simple men must be made in some way to bear a pregnant sense, either as mere men, as opposed to God, or as common men as opposed to the noble or the priestly, or as heathen as opposed to the Israelites, to none of which does it seem naturally to lend itself here, before a significance equal to the demands of its context is given. Almost as little can be said for the version as old as the Septuagint. They are like a man that has broken a covenant. This rendering certainly involves a forcing of the words out of their natural sense. No such exegetical objections lie against the rendering like Adam, any difficulties that may be brought against it, indeed, are imported from without the clause itself. In itself, the rendering is wholly natural, nor is it without positive commendations of force. The transgressing of Adam as the great normative act of covenant-breaking offers itself naturally as the fit standard over against which the heinousness of a covenant-breaking of Israel could be thrown out. And Hosea, who particularly loves allusions to the earlier history of Israel, compare chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 10, chapter 11, verse 8, chapter 12, verse 4, was the very prophet to think here of the sin of our first father. We shall let Delich, however, outline for us the considerations which commend this interpretation, and to his remarks we shall append the discussion of Professor Given as a specimen of the comments which are conceived in a more practical vein. Says Delich on Job 31, verse 33, most expositors have taken care them, in Job 31 verse 33, after the manner of man, but appropriate as this meaning of the expression is in Psalm 82 verse 7 in accordance with the antithesis and the parallelism, which, see, it would be as tame here and altogether expressionless as in the parallel passage Hosea 6 verse 7, the passage which comes mainly into consideration here, since the force of the prophetic utterances, they have Ke'adam transgressed the covenant, consists in this, that Israel is accused of a transgression which is only to be compared to that of the first man created, here as there a like transgression of the expressed will of God, as also according to Romans 5 verse 14, Israel's transgression is that fact in the historical development of redemption which stands by the side of Adam's transgression. And the mention of Adam in Hosea cannot surprise one, since he also shows himself in other respects to be familiar with the contents of Genesis and to refer back to it. Vid Genesis, pages 11 to 13. Says Professor Given, they, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. This rendering, supported by the Vulgate, Cyril, Luther, Rosenmüller, and Wunscher, is decidedly preferable and yields a suitable sense. God, in his great goodness, had planted Adam in paradise, but Adam violated the commandment which prohibited his eating of the tree of knowledge, and thereby transgress the covenant of his God. Loss of fellowship and expulsion from Eden were the penal consequences that immediately followed. Israel, like Adam, had been settled by God in Palestine, the glory of all lands, but ungrateful for God's great bounty and gracious gift, they broke the commandment of their God, the condition of which, as in the case of the Adamic covenant, was obedience. Thus the comparison projects the shadow of a coming event, 
when Israel would leave the land of promise. Still more practical remarks on the essential sense of the comparison may be found in the same volume from the hands of the Reverend C. Jordan and of Professor James Orr. We do not think we should err, therefore, if we adopted the translation like Adam, but if we should err, we should err in a great and goodly company. It is difficult to estimate the number of commentators who take this side or the other in a question like this. The standard of judgment by which the admission of commentators even into the poll is governed is so varied that the terms most expositors, the majority of interpreters, can have little but a subjective value, nor have we been careful to accumulate names. Much less have we sought to gather together the names of all those who have advocated this particular opinion. Nevertheless, a considerable list of such names has come unsought into our hands as we have searched for light on the passage, and it cannot be otherwise than interesting to call over the role that thus lies by us. The following expositors of the passages, at least, then, have found it to read like Adam, Cyril of Alexandria, Jerome, Rashi, Ababana, Luther, Montanus, Castalio, Clarius, Tarnovius, Tarleton, Bowman, Brown, Brake, Mark, de Moor, Witzes, Van Master, Edwards, 2, 457, Dingstadius, Mauger, Newcomb, Rosenmüller, Hesselberg, Schröder, Ackermann, Preiswerk, Bötreuth, Stuck, Drake, Umbreit, Hitzig, Wilma, Kurz, Keil, Delitz, on Job 31, verse 33, Hofmann, Schriftbeweis, Pusey, Cowles, Wünsche, Oehler, Schmoller, McCurdy, Arelli, Given, Or, A. A. Hodge, Bavink, Voss, Knabenbauer.